I'm Lori Farkas, and uh, my grandchildren are sixth generation Albany, so it means that my family's always loved Albany. Moved away several times, moved out of the country once, but uh, Thomas Wolfe was wrong, you can go home again. And uh, I've been at Water, Gas and Light 25 years. My background working was in public relations. I was head of public relations for the old CNS Bank, which became Nations Bank, which is now Bank America. And I worked with them for 12 years, took a two-year hiatus, and um, then came to work to um, improve the image, both internally and externally, for the City of Albany slash the Water, Gas and Light Commission. And at the time that I came here, there were no programs. You came here, you paid your utility bill after you signed up for services. Um, you disconnected if you moved, and if you didn't pay your bill, you got disconnected, and that was pretty much it. And so I set about creating some programs that would make us more user-friendly to the entire community, that would put us um, in, a, in a much nicer place than we were. Because as Americans, we all know that we have freedom of choice, but in the state of Georgia, you have no freedom of choice when you go to use utilities. And so right off the bat, people don't like us. And in many cases, because we're in a poverty area, the largest bill our customer base pays is their utility bill. So they don't like us for a second reason. So the programs I began to create were to be more accessible to the public, but also to create some programs that would affect the population that uses water, gas, and light uh, for their utilities. Um, I have two first jobs. My very first job was at 12, and my best friend, Dr. Hollis's daughter, Carol, and I started a summer daycare. And so we had 10 small children every day. One week we would be at my parents' house. The next week, and she lived around the corner, we would be at her parents' house, Dr. Hollis's house. And we did all kind of art projects and all kind of projects. We fed them lunch, and then gratefully, their parents came and got them after lunch. So. I don't know how we came up with that idea and our parents approved it. You would never think today, and we probably had 10 or 12 children every day in our little daycare. But the job that I really loved was I taught art for four years, all through high school at the Junior Museum, which we don't have anymore, um, over on residence. And I had kids from kindergarten all the way up to seniors in high school. So I started when I was 14 and I did it until I graduated high school. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was an after school job and it just gave me a lot of pleasure. Well, I, um, when I was five, my grandparents took me to the University of Miami to see my cousin in a diving exposition. Um, and they did a water ballet before the diving. Well, all at five that I saw were these girls in these beautiful floral caps doing all these beautiful moves in the pool. And I said, I'm going to the University of Miami when I graduate, when I grow up. And so I got accepted at Georgia, which my whole family went to. Um, the University of Georgia still uses my great-grandfather's will as the most perfect trust for their law students. Um, so my whole family went to Georgia. I, on the other hand, said I'm going to the University of Miami, and that's where I went. Um, I didn't finish. I um, married a doctor and moved to Toronto, Canada. So um, I didn't complete my education there. But I was a major in psychology and a minor in art. Well, let me say this. The, the city commission, the mayor, and the Water, Gas, and Light Commission came to me. I was looking for a PR job after I retired from the bank for two years and had been offered to be second in charge of public relations at Phoebe Putney. There was no public relations department at Phoebe in 1987. That's hard to believe today. Uh, Tina Harden was going to be the director and I met with Duncan Moore who was the Joel Warnick of that day and the job started in January and this is September. So I knew I had a job, and I wasn't in any rush to get a job. I financially was fine. And um, in September, or the early part of October, the city commission, this commission, and the mayor came to me and said, we'd really like to look at your resume. We understand you're looking for a PR job. In a small town, people die in their public relations jobs because if that's what your personality is, you love what you're doing, and you just have it forever. In a big city, there are multiple places to use your talent. So it was very difficult. I had never had to really look for a job before, and I realized real quickly, 
it doesn't matter how great my resume is from the bank, there's no jobs. So when this came up, I said, I'm going to try this. I know I have the other job in January. Uh, we'll see how it goes. And so I just, I fell in love with the hands-on, dealing with people, being given the latitude to be able to come up with programs that have won national attention, national awards. That's, you know, the community that you love and then you create something that's accepted and then recognized nationally, it makes you feel good, you know, you, that you've done something for your community. And I love this community. Well, I think, and I do a lot of career counseling, and I say this, find, if you have these three things in alignment, you will never work a day in your life. Find something that you love to do, something that you're good at, and something you can make a living at. I love to sing. I can't sing a note. I can't make a living singing. I love to do needlepoint, cross stitch. I'm real good at it. I can't make a living doing it. So if you get those three things in alignment, something you love, something you're good at, and something you can make a living at, you won't ever want to retire. And we are seeing as baby boomers, we're all going to have to work longer and longer into our 80s. And so your generation really needs to think long term. You know, we're told that people change careers 10 times in their lives, not jobs, but careers. Um, I've been fortunate. The majority of my career has all been in dealing with the public. And because my family has lived here for so many generations, I'm interwoven and, and networked with so many different people that when somebody calls and needs something, I know who to call. We've gotten people jobs, we've gotten housing for people, mortgages paid, eyeglasses for people that couldn't afford it, hearing aids, uh, resumes written, all sorts of different things just by networking in the community. And I think that's one of my long suits is that I sort of know who to call um, you know, to get help for somebody that needs help. I thought about this a lot, and my very first thought was Rosa Parks, because this tiny little woman who had been oppressed all her life, that day, something fire in her made her do such an outlandish, outrageous thing that nobody would have thought she did. And that was going to be my first choice. But I quote Helen Keller all the time. Here's a person who couldn't see, couldn't hear, was locked in her own world until she was 10 or 12, uh, until Annie Sullivan came along, who became so well known in the entire world. And my favorite quote by her is, I'm only one person. I cannot do everything, but there is a something that I can do. I shall not say no to the thing that I can do. And I see so many people at Water, Gas and Light who are squandering their lives. Young people that come in here that can't pay their bill because their priorities are in the wrong place. And I think so often of that quote. Um, she's been in the news a lot lately, little Alexandra Squ Scott, who had Alexandra's lemonade stands. Um, over $10 million. I think it's much higher than that now because she saw a need at seven that other parents couldn't afford the chemo that she was receiving. And now hundreds of millions of dollars are pouring in through her lemonade stand. If she could do that by seven, as sick as she was, what can we do every day to make this community better? And um, I think there's too many squawkers. I, I almost could swear that people that squawk don't volunteer for anything in this community. Um, they always see the glass as half full. And it makes us all feel bad about ourselves every day. I, th I think that you know, if you don't like something, then go volunteer. It doesn't have to be the thing that you don't like. Go volunteer for something in this community, and I promise it's going to get better. The biggest challenge, and I, know, I hate when people keep saying education. It is education, but it's education in the household. I don't know when it got okay to have children out of wedlock. I don't know when it got okay to wear pajamas into a public building. We have let, because everybody has their rights, we as a society, even though we know certain things are not morally or ethically right, we turn, we turn away from them. The biggest thing I see in working here every day and talking to hundreds of people a week maybe is our priorities are all in the wrong place. Everybody has their hand out. Nobody has their hand to pull somebody up. Um, you know, you've got to get at least your high school education. You've got to go for higher learning. 
Um, we have too many service jobs, working at McDonald's, working at Burger King. Those are great first jobs. Um, I deal a lot with customers who say there's nothing I can do, and I say God gave everybody a talent. And my best story is I had a girl that came in in tears. Her hair was magnificent, and she had no money to pay. She had no job. She couldn't find a job. And I said, well, who did your hair? And it was prom time. She said, I did it. I said, well, did you ever think of maybe going for a cosmetology degree and doing people's hair? And I said, right now, you know, if you got a city business license, maybe you could do people's hair for prom. There's things you could do. She didn't realize she had that talent of, of doing hair. So I think we all need to look and see. We all have a talent. God didn't, you know, he gave everybody equal talent. We just don't all recognize it. So I think our challenge in Albany, because we're an indigent care center, and I just said this this morning, if Albany was only taking care of Albany's poor, we wouldn't have a problem in the world. But because we're the center of 14 counties, anybody in those surrounding 14 counties who is impoverished moves to Albany to get free service. And so now Albanians are taking care of 15 counties worth of poor people. That is a huge burden. So I see that as our the worst thing that, that's happening in this community. And the best way to fix that is to have two parent households, only have children that you can afford, you know, um, and then make sure your children are read to, make sure your children go to school and get their education. It, it's nobody else's responsibility but each of us. And if each of us take care of our own little nuclear family, then we'd need less government. There'd be less crime there'd be less poverty, we'd just be a much better place. And I always say, I can't fix Georgia or the world or the country, but each of us can make Albany better. And just like the community in the news the other day, you know, they said they're not going to take it anymore, the lady that had the break-in. Um, I think we're on the cusp of people standing up and saying, this isn't right, we're going to have to start to take care of ourselves. I, first of all, my mother raised me that if you have a love for reading, you will never be bored. And so I instilled that in my children. So I would take all my favorite authors. Oh, Henry is my favorite. So I would take book, my books. I would take um, my family photographs because at the end of your life, all you have is your memories. And your memories are documented in your photographs. So I would want all of my photographs of all of my memories that I um, have, have had taken over the years from the, all the way back to my ancestors, all those pictures, those beautiful pictures, where you've been, what you've done, and it would keep you company on the island. And then I would take a journal and I would document how I got into this misadventure and I would turn it into an adventure book. So I would write the story of my misadventure turning it into an adventure and that's what I would take with me. Yeah, passion. It's got to be passion, no matter what it is, whether you're making microchips or doing neurosurgery. You have to have a passion for what you do, because if you have a passion, you're going to make sure that you do it well. It's knowing that you have a set of policies, which we all have to have. We have to have guidelines to live by. But when you are dealing with individuals, there's always a different twist. And so you have to be, when, when I make a decision, I have to be really careful to know that I have to treat everybody the same. And yet when I get a customer who has had something horrendous happen in their life that was no fault of their own, like this person today, um, I feel for this person and I'm going to do everything I can to help her get what she needs to do. And it may not just be a water, gas, and light issue. Um, so it's a prickly fence to sit on to treat everyone the same and that's how everybody wants to be treated, but then to also have enough compassion or empathy to be able to get them what they need within the confines of what the policies and rules and regulations are. And, and that's all the way up to federal regulations. There really is. Um, in Desert Storm in 1990, we were sending the troops to go to Desert Storm and on third, they were leaving on Monday, and on Thursday, the city attorney called me Thursday afternoon and said, oh my gosh, we did not plan anything for the troop send-off on Monday. 
they're leaving at 7 in the morning, they can only stop for X number of moments. I dropped the ball. This was Al Greasaber. We knew if anybody could pull it off, you could pull it off. I said, okay, fine. By Friday afternoon, I had school children lined up wherever the troops were going to be with yellow ribbons. I had, it was going to be at the Civic Center, it was, at 7, everybody had to be there at 6 in the morning because the convoy could only stop at 7 for a certain number of minutes. I had Miss Albany that was going to present the captain, which I think was Paul Joyner at the time, Captain Joyner, with the dozen roses. I had doves that at the end flew off. I had someone, I had um, someone from each military group and each department of the city stand up and salute them when they stopped. I had a World War I vet in his original uniform stand up next to last to salute them. We did a set of bleachers. And the very last thing was a mom. I'm very theatrical. I had theatrical grandparents. I had a mom in her apron and her handkerchief and she cried and waved them off. I had 10,000 people at 6 o'clock in the morning at the Civic Center. Um, and the second thing would probably be during the flood. Um, nobody thought about, we had three days to prepare, nobody thought about getting any of our employees tetanus shots. I arranged for all the employees, city and water, gas and light, to get tetanus shots. And nobody thought about feeding them. So I met with Phoebe, my future employer at the time, but not really. Mm -hmm. But I met with Phoebe and they graciously fed every city, county and water, gas, EMT, anybody that was working on flood related things, they fed them for the duration. And so I'm really proud of that. Um, you know, I always say in our worst times we show our best selves. And then I did the monument at the Civic Center. I designed that and wrote that. It's the quality of life. We are, number one, three hours from anything you want to do. We're three hours from major shopping, Atlanta. We are three hours from the Atlantic. We are three hours from the Gulf. And we're five hours from the most beautiful mountains in the world. Um, we are in a wonderful location. Our weather is terrific. Um, the people that live in Albany have great spirit. For the size city that we are, we have a wonderful symphony. We have wonderful art outlets. Uh, we don't pat ourselves on the back enough. So we have wonderful things. There's something for everybody here. We have beautiful golf courses. I think that we need to start to market, and other people have said this, as a retirement place to come to. I think that's what we, we talk about it. It sounds good, and I don't know how much work we've done to get retirees, because here you have a change of season. When you move to Florida, you have one season summer. But our fall here is beautiful. Our spring here is beautiful. We have the second highest retail sales in the state next to Atlanta and the lowest cost of living. I think those are two great stats to have. It would all sound so, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? Egotistical, I guess. I, I guess that there'll be tough shoes to fit. I mean, everybody is replaceable. My mother taught me that. I went to work one time with 105 fever and she got so mad at me. I ended up in the hospital, I almost died when I was at the bank. And she said, take a bucket of water, put your fist in it, pull it out, and you'll see how much of an impression you made. Don't ever do this again. Mm -hmm. And so I know everyone is replaceable. And there's somebody much smarter than me coming down the pike. I'd like to work till I'm 80, but we'll see. Um, but I think I would like for them to say she was very honest. She was not a hypocrite. And it'll be big shoes to fill. And I, I know I'll be proud of whoever gets this job when I'm 80, which is a while off.